need to remind both of you that the root of the evil eye lies not in magic and maleficium, but in envy. And that the eyes, to use a cliche, are the windows of the soul. We enter the magical realm subsequently with the idea that the gaze can project effect upon others, not just as emotional spillover, but as manifest intention by direction. We still talk, for instance, of withering looks and of looking daggers at people, and perhaps rather more welcome to come <coughs> hither looks. <laughs> now, of course, the evil eye may derive not from dark inclinations, but from some in, inherent and unintended bitterness in an individual. A Yorkshireman who was aware of a baleful effect in his gaze in the early 19th century wished no harm to his neighbours. So he was advised to direct his first daily glance at a pear tree to dissipate the toxic effect. In time, the pear tree withered away, but presumably <coughs> no humans. Another Yorkshireman with this affliction, you can tell us something from Yorkshire, can't you? Another Yorkshireman with this affliction developed a habit of directing his gaze at the ground and never meeting another person's eyes, not even his children. Part of the social discomfort these men must have experienced in this would have derived from the historically induced perception of the evil eye and its affliction in this country. Now, in Britain, the special political, um, social and religious circumstances of the 16th to 17th century with the related makings over witchcraft exercises a carryover effect. <coughs> the evil eye has become rooted in the sense of a disempowered and economically distressed class that was the primary source of folk magic and the recipient of accusations of witchcraft. Malignity, rather than evil, has become the key word. And this is reinforced among ourselves by the appearance of evil eye symbols amongst other apotropaic symbols and actions. But a modern tradition, Albania, reaffirms the association with envy and the implicit <coughs> connection with poverty. In its very newness and creativity, it demonstrates the lingering human belief that households would do well not to leave their house and well-being to social institutions like police and government, but to get on and invoke protection against threats themselves. It also demonstrates that such customs may constitute more than just a customary adherence to vernacular tradition. And indeed, they may show a constructive and creative contemporary approach to deterring those threats which come at a remove from the instigator. <coughs> now, the association of the evil eye with envy <coughs> has a religious sanction in the Middle East, which is where we encounter it most. In the third century, but you see a few selected tourist destinations for the middle of Evil Eye <coughs> Seeker. In the third century, Heliodorus described it. When anyone looks at what is excellent with an envious eye, he fills the surrounding atmosphere with a pernicious quality and transmits his own envenomed exhalations into whatever is nearest to him. In the Judaic Mishnah, the evil eye is a situation where someone with a, such a gaze cannot bear with equanimity someone else's good fortune. And the Talmud affirms that 99 out of 100 die of an evil eye and notes a number of superstitious effects to ward off uh, the evil effects. The Jewish Encyclopedia defines evil eye as the supposed power of bewitching or harming by spiteful looks attributed to certain persons as a natural endowment. So those Yorkshiremen I mentioned earlier may have known that they were at heart cats. Islam follows much the same line. The Arabic word al translated as the evil eye, 
refers to when a person harms another with his eye. But the prophet was less sweeping than the Talmud. One third, he reckoned, of those who are in the grave are there because of their <coughs> evil eye. Still taking things pretty seriously. <coughs> now it's no surprise that we should encounter the evil eye in the Balkan regions. But why should Albania be an apparent focus of apotropaic renewal? Albania has been somewhat battered by political fortunes over the centuries. Its Christianity, Orthodox and Roman Catholic, was displaced during its 525 years as part of the Ottoman Empire, during which time political incentives led to Albanians accepting Islam in greater numbers than their Balkan neighbours, except in the very north of the country. It's within this historical context that we would have encountered the more familiar protectors of animal horns, garlic and horseshoes, shared in common with neighbouring countries and wider afield. And we would have encountered the Dorzelek, a kind of scarecrow, but with a wider brief of activity, typically a homemade <coughs> and close to life-size figure. Now, a turbulent period through the World Wars was succeeded in 1944 by one of the most austere and authoritarian communist regimes known which in 1990 collapsed. Throughout, Albania and Albanians were economically and culturally held back. Religious observation of any kind was outlawed in 1967 and places of worship converted to secular purposes. With the introduction of a novel thing called an election in 1991, the country took on, with notable inexperience, capitalist democracy and a sudden rush of new inequalities. The instability of the profit motive was underlined in 1997 by the collapse of pyramid schemes in which most of the population had enrolled their savings, largely thanks to, their, to encouragement from their new democratic and economically immature government, and to peer pressure as well. Now, the inevitable implosion of the pyramid schemes caused personal bankruptcies and sudden impoverishing losses that amounted to 1.2 billion US dollars among a population of just 3 million. In the subsequent and not entirely surprising uprising, the elected government was topping, toppled, state-linked and government buildings were destroyed, and many died. Organised criminal gangs took a control of a number of towns as de facto warlords, and in the end, armed UN intervention was needed to restore calm and wrest political control back to a centre. Now, somewhere in this period, as families lost their livelihood and savings, the traditional protectives lost their glamour, generating a, tri a typical tradition versus modernism crisis in Albanians of all religious persuasions, which incidentally today are 59% Islam, 18% Christian, and the rest other. The question that many have faced, as Ishmael Kader has written of in Spring Flowers, Spring Frost, was, should old traditional ways and outlooks be abandoned altogether or updated to fit the new circumstances? Well, if we are to assume that long-standing Albanian quasi-peasant culture was not eradicated by Ottoman or communist conservatism, then we need to assume that the anthropological idea of limited good briefly that there's only so much good luck or wealth around in a community and uh, if you take more than your share you're inviting resentment that probably still held some influence in the Albanian mindset even in the 1990s the antithesis of limited good the free flow of consumer capitalism that replaced it portrayed of course by its proponents as unlimited good must have been an enticing and exciting enticement. 
But for a population new to democracy and consumer capitalism, it must also have been rather bewildering. Perhaps this explains the popularity of the pyramid schemes at all levels from the government downwards. The logic of their inevitable failure simply wasn't available to a populace lacking modern economic experience. Eventually, it became obvious that the schemes brought great benefit to a few, but greater hardship to many, and their collapse ushered in a doggy dog situation where less savoury traditions of power supplanted any communitarianism. The greedy, amoral few, often people's neighbours, again <coughs> benefited at others' experience, expense. Faced with a secular, materialist acquisitiveness, the garlic, horseshoes and horns were out of their depth. So it seems an upgrade option was chosen in order to combat the evil eye of consumer capitalism and in some cases to supplement their more magical predecessors, selected goods of that materialist culture had to play a symbolic role. This can be seen as a classic example of tradition updating itself and also reflects changing perceptions the world over. As worldviews drift away from magical agency, the oblique protection offered by such amulets as garlic and animal horns loses relevance. And even though the basic stimulus remains, a more literal artefact is drafted in to meet contemporary experience. Perhaps we might think that the tap left at graveyards and crematoria in Britain today is an example of that same ethos in funerary tradition. In Albania, in this reimagining re of protection, the Dordalek scarecrow maintained some relevance and bridged the gap between tradition and today. Though Dordalek are, oft are often usually homemade, in my experience, a life-size figure or mannequin is, after all, an everyday object of consumer experience and simultaneously can give the impression of somebody watching, which is naturally a key feature behind traditional eye symbols, keeping an eye on things. Hence, these figures, these Dordalek, maintain their role in rural districts especially. In the 1990s, however, alongside Dordalek, both in rural and urban locations, appeared an often quite bizarre manifestation of the tradition, the cuckoo or doll. The cuckoo is where an absurd element creeps in, being most often a shop-bought soft toy, very often, naturally, a teddy bear. It's not a far cry from the doll which, as I say, could be seen as a giant doll or mannequin, to the new tradition that grew up in response to the economic disaster that capitalism was seen to have caused. Perhaps the dolls are a kind of puppet even, but in a contemporary context, they may also be understood as an appropriate reaction to consumer capitalism. Absurd they might seem, but in their context, they make a good kind of sense. Now taken together, these items represent in a bizarre fashion both the persistence of tradition and its changeability in response to external impulses. <coughs> Elizabeth Gowing reported a householder and everyone else I asked, she said, as saying that using soft toys against the eye started only in the 90s with democracy. But I believe it more likely that the stimulus for the new tradition was capitalism rather than democracy in the collapse of the pyramid schemes and the result of anarchy. The new tradition speaks directly to the inherent absurdity in the capitalist logic of un unlimited good. Now it's a shock to see, once first, a potropaic teddy bear. <laughs> Already an incongruous concept, the cuddly toy battling man malice the locations frequently enhance the incongruity. 
The fact that I saw many from the highway as a flash past on buses somehow enhanced that incongruity, like a glimpse of strangeness impacting on the retina. Like a brand new three-storey furniture showroom, glass fronted near Prisrael in ethically, ethically Albanian Kosovo, had a three-foot teddy bear strapped to that glass frontage at the first floor level. A similar size bear dangled from a long rope above the petrol pumps on a garage fork near Lushnia, near Albania. By the way, I should point out at this point, I can't speak Albanian. I've no idea if my pronunciation of these towns is accurate, but bear with me. A full-size Dordalek, dressed as a jihadist, perched on the roof of a bungalow in this posture. Bizarre things. The locations, however, tallied with the general apocalyptic preference for front thresholds. A number of Kukuruwa in classic positions, like over the main door, <laughs> including over the large shutter doors of a warehouse. But others appeared on balconies, including this miniaturised Hogwarts door to that. <laughs> Strapped to drain pipes. I think it was Bugs Bunny. <laughs> or outside shops. In domestic contexts, they tend to occupy first floor locations. And this is probably because in Albanian houses, the ground floor has been typically used for utilitarian purposes like store or utility rooms or a garage and the home proper begins above this space. Frequently, they can be seen strapped to projecting steel, no, that's bugs, buddy, isn't it? Yeah. Steel or concrete struts on unfinished buildings. Though this may also be the haunt of a Dordalek. Cafes I saw in the north, on hiking trails and not occupied residentially, had cuckoos suspended around seating areas. Now it should be mentioned that Kuku did not necessarily replace and displace traditional protectives. It was a Kermit, maybe, with the garlic. It is also worth repeating that the Kuku often appears on buildings under construction where tools are unlikely to be left and there is little to covet except the land itself and construction materials. Indeed, many such houses are owned by Albanians working abroad to finance their construction and thus are left in abeyance for protracted periods of absence. And I note in this case Alina's reference to deserted houses requiring uh, special rituals in Romania. Now, in the cases of these unfinished buildings, it is not so much valuable objects or businesses that are being protected but the sense of material well-being in general. That is, they're expressing a more existential sense of threat. And in this way, their function overlaps with that of the traditional, more magical apotropaics. Wherever a cuckoo or dordalek is deployed, it is invariably outdoors, open to the elements. Dordalek can handle this better than soft toys, which soon become very sorry spectacles indeed. Oh. The panda outside the workshop in Belesh was by far the sorriest of them all, I think. Now, these things do nothing to improve the appearance of the home or to invite a customer to shop. They're not appealing or cuddly anymore. <laughs> They're not only incongruous, but they're sometimes pathetically unattractive. So what's going on? And these are my assumptions from here. But one reason that I think should be considered is that cuckoo may be considered the antithesis of bling. Bling is showing off, designed to and employed to attract attention and to instill a sense of envy in the beholder. You can see the kind of thing I mean by in the home section of the Guardian and Times colour magazines, 
which don't usually discuss the kind of security paraphernalia insurance premiums that are entailed. An ordinary home, on the other hand, needs a different and cheaper strategy to counteract any desire to steal or rob. <coughs> now, protection against the evil eye largely depends on diffusing um, ill intentions, envy, resentment, or covetousness, and to some extent, on concealing one's own wealth. Frequently, it works by deflecting the gaze, attracting the eye, and thereby causing people to, to look away from what might be of, of interest or value. All by creating a vague sense of distaste, of surrealisation, if you like. A rich man, as we know, could more easily pass unidentified by dressing as an unlovely tramp, which seems to be what these objects are doing. This is how the modern custom works. A dirty, sodden, faded, soft toy certainly attracts the eye briefly, but it turns the viewer's intention off, unless, of course, they're a folklorist. <laughs> it offers nothing to covet. And then the gaze has passed. Interest has waned. The would-be marauder has moved on. Alternatively and simultaneously, the soft toy may work upon sentiment to distract by striking a, a poignant note in a culture that values family life highly and probably an individual who still remembers their childhood teddy bear. Either way, as it ages, the child's consumer item, in theory at least, turns in on itself declaring itself, and by implication, its owner's assets, the forgotten junk it is destined to become anyway. Even apotropaics can be ironic. Now this junk point is also exemplified in a kind of modern, long-standing modern Western tradition, which may, for all I know, have given rise in some way to Albania's new talismans, via expatriate contacts in the 1990s in the West. And this is the attachment to working vehicles. <laughs> now, when I asked Mark Dempsey, the owner of this van, why he put his teddy bear there, he said, well, it's for look, isn't it? <laughs> and that he had retrieved it from his wife's disposal pile. Well, yeah. And in the USA especially, mm -hmm. they appear on rubbish trucks, yeah. Yeah. as demonstrated in the 2010 Pixar animation, Toy Story 3. In my experience, though, this custom is markedly less common in the UK today than it was 30 or 40 years ago, when I was an inveterate hitchhiker. And it also should be remembered that these are vehicles, not homes. So to sum up, the 1990s were a time of re-evaluating Albanian identities, including its traditions, and were a crucial backdrop to the resurgence and revision of evil eye customs. The evil eye is something of a barometer of inequity, becoming prominent in a culture where society produces goods that can arouse desire or envy, but where resources and access to these goods are unevenly allotted. This describes the Albania of the 1990s and is little less relevant today. And it's open to further research whether this new custom has spread or is now found in neighbouring countries. The kuku, in its modern form, is not a tradition that came in with democracy, but with capitalism, and implicitly globalisation as a local adaptation to unfamiliar forces that were and remain beyond local control. In reflecting socio-economic change, the evolution of local apotropaic emblems also reflects the global shift in mindset in recent centuries. Albania's supplantation of garlic by soft toys codifies a shift away from the subtle and magical which imply a traditional world of unseen forces that have their own implicit logic 
towards the literal and materialist, <coughs> where negative intent can be far from implicit and all too manifest, as Albanians found out only too well in the 1990s. So one point I want to make to stress in this is the, the creative response that was made in the 1990s to the onset of new threats and the importance that we are still doing this in full consciousness. And this is one reason why this custom has fascinated me so much. Thank you.